Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. Hope you enjoy the video. Listen to me, man. You have a great life in front of you. But your great life is in front of you. It's not behind you. What you did back there ain't got nothing to do with what God got for you. What you did back there was learn the lessons to get you to where you are at this particular moment right here. But what God got for you, do you know, man, that you can actually mess your life completely up? You can jack it all the way up and you can turn around and get it right. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you could have had a baby out of wedlock and still be all right? Do you know that you can be divorced multiple times and still be okay? Do you understand that you cannot have a degree and still be just fine? You want to know how I know? Because I'm telling you what I know. I lost everything twice. I don't know if you've ever lost everything before, but I've been bottomed out twice. I done seen rock bottom two times. I've been through some walls up in here, man. I'm just trying to tell you, man, God is really with you. You ain't got to believe me. You ain't got to believe me. But keep doing it without God. Let me know how it worked for you. Matter of fact, write a book on how to make it without God. Because I want to I wanna read it. I want to read the first page. And then I want to read the last page. Because there ain't going to be but two. You can jack your life all the way up. God is in the forgiving business. You can make all the mistakes you want to make or think you shouldn't make. God is in the get it together business. If you got dreams and visions, I got news for you. God is in the make your dream come true business. He did it for me. How he won't do it for you? A lot of y'all better than me. I'm just going to flat out tell you. you ain't, most of y'all ain't done what I had to do to get to where I am today. You just ain't had to do this type of dirt. You ain't been homeless, so what, what you, you ain't, you ain't got to scrap like me. Most of y'all didn't come, you're not old as me. I've overcome it all because I have a relationship with him. And you can listen to me and tell that I'm not a perfect person. I am not a perfect Christian. I have my flaws. I am a flawed human being. But guess what? You are too. You ain't got it all together. I dare you to say you do. I make a lot of money, man. But guess what? I ain't got it all together. I'm hurting. I'm hurting, man. Everybody tripping through something. Everybody, I don't care who you are, you're going through something. But if you got God, you can make it. I'm just telling you this little piece of information. Look, I don't see most of y'all most of the time. So you're sitting here, you're kind of looking at me a little bit odd. Oh, why Steve talking like this stuff? I'm just trying to put you, put you on game. Because let me tell you, all y'all want to be successful. And you want to be happy, but you got to get there. It's a shortcut to getting there. The shortcut to getting there is the relationship with God. If you try it without him, you're going to fail miserably. You're going to sink, man. It's going to be ugly for you. Now, this is what you got to do. Identify your gift and get busy with it. God gave all of you a gift. Identify your gift. It is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your gift. Get busy at that. If it's drawing... If it's teaching, if it's sharing, if it's caregiving, he put that gift inside of you. He didn't hide it under a rock or put it under the mountain or put it on the mountain somewhere. He put the gift in you. And you look at me any kind of way you want to, what I'm just telling you is real. That's how you become successful. Identify your God-given gift, what he gave you at birth. If you do that, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. So what are the keys to living a good life? Here's number one, productivity. You really won't be happy if you don't produce. Six-sevenths of our life was to be devoted to labor and work, to produce, to produce a work of art, to produce a crop of corn, to produce a good family to produce an enterprise that that that's the essence of life in its best form first is to be a producer here's what all of us have the miracle and it's almost godlike in its potential the ability to recreate only god can create the seed the soil the sunshine the rain the seasons the miracle of life but here's what humans can do recreate those components into a harvest 
by planting the seed, carefully taking care of it in the summer, reaping the rewards in the harvest. We call that recreation. We can't make a tree, but we can use the tree for wood to build a house, shelter for our family. It's called recreation. It is almost, it's godlike in terms of potential to recreate, to take your hours and your energy and your life and a bit of skill and create, actually recreate a career, a future, possibilities, fortune, recreate. The key is to use it. And you won't be happy if you aren't really extending yourself. Because here's really the goal of the human adventure. The full development of all your potential. That's the goal. The full development of all your potential. Why not see how far you can go, how much you can earn, how much you can share, how much you can give? Why not see what all you could be, what you could become? 23 years old, I'm living in a little apartment in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Little tiny duplex. I lived on one half of this thing. And me and my dog, Coppo. I don't know what I was doing, trying to take care of a dog. I couldn't even take care of myself. One rainy night, this dude, Danny, comes in <clears throat> with drugs. Another day where I said, I'm going to quit today. Now it's, now it's 11 o'clock at night. I didn't quit. Ten times I failed again. Danny leaves the house, and when Danny leaves the house, I didn't know, but he set it up to rob me and beat me up. Danny leaves the house, and I let him out the front door, and this other big dude in the rain, a rainy Louisiana night, puts a 45 caliber pistol in my face right here, okay? I had a plate in my hand. I had, been, I had something to eat, and I had a plate when I walked Danny to the door. And, and this big dude, this big dude, this guy had to be this big hovered over me with a gun in my face. And when he did, my reaction was to hit him with the plate in the face. You know, I broke this plate. It was an unbreakable plate, one of those plates you can't break. And I broke it in his face, like just cracked it in his face. Thing breaks and he becomes like a monster. This scar right here in my head is, he took that 45 caliber and jammed it in my face. Like, I don't, I don't mean jammed it, I mean cracked me right here in the forehead. My life changes now. I'm, I'm getting ready to get cracked so many times here. I'm getting ready to get the lesson of my life of where I'm really living. I already knew it, but this was the exclamation mark on where my life had gone from being a good kid to this far from dying. He hits me here. He cracks me over both my eyes here, underneath these two eyes. Uh, What's the word? Incapacitates both my arms. Incapacitates both my arms because he takes and chops them both behind the elbows so you can't use your arms. Like literally, I'm walking around, I can't move my arms. Blood's coming down. Every wall in this apartment, in this room, and the ceiling has blood on it. They ransacked the house, robbed me of a little bit of money, and literally leave me on the floor for a day. My dog's in the back. My dog's locked up in the back, the Doberman. They set it up to do this. This is what happens when you hang around bad people. Sooner or later, a day's going to come where you're going to pay the price. I get rushed to the hospital. My girlfriend's there. She's in the back. She comes out, gets me to the hospital. I spent three days in a hospital. Actually, I go to the hospital. I go to the hospital. They put in 70 stitches in my head and face. Like, my whole face is just carved up. The sheriff's department comes because they know something bad's happening. And I'm like, I'm fine, I can go home. They stitch me up. I go home to my mother. I walk into my mother's house on, on, in, in the little brick house that I resented so much. And, and, I, and I walk to the house and I go to the house in the back door. I knock on the back door. I'm beat up now, okay? Face is swollen. My mom comes to the door and she's, she's like, what, what? Where's my son at? Where's my son at? I'm like, Mom, I am your son. Where is my son? She, nobody could recognize who I was. That's how beat up I was. I go in the house. I try to lay down. I, she she try, puts me in, this, you know, on a, on a couch, and, and I try to lay down there. And 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 they, the, the the hospital doesn't want me to go to sleep because I could be, I could I could literally die. So they bring me back to the hospital. I spend three days in the hospital. 
and I'm like, I'm done. No more drugs. Okay, literally, I can't even recognize myself anymore. No more drugs. I'm done using drugs, okay? Guess what happens? I'm using drugs 15 minutes later, 10 times a day in the hospital. See, you would think, you would think, looking back, I would think this would be the day I would quit. For two more years, I would use drugs every day. Couldn't get out. Couldn't quit. Okay? Look, no, no, nobody starts using drugs and thinks they're going to be a drug addict. I didn't. I, I started using drugs, and for some reason, something happened where those drugs just took over. <clears throat> my mom, my mom, uh, at the age of 25, my mom says to me, you're no longer welcome in my home. You're no longer welcome in my business. I don't want to see you. And that was, that was the day my life turned so, 24 hours later, I was in a treatment center because my mom had the courage to say, enough is enough, I'm done. Really, everybody was pretty much done with me at this point. You know, my, my, my older brother died when I was 20. So three years, well, I guess, yeah, five years before this, my older brother dies. He was worried about me. All I know at this point, I lost my dad when I was 10. I lost my brother when I was 20. I lost, you know, I, I gave up my career and maybe I'm going to be a baseball player to drugs. I've lost five or six jobs now, and I'm a loser. I'm a total loser. But I do have this little, this little light inside of me that says I'm special. I have this little thing inside of me that says, hey, you, you are special, you know. You have something. But it was just covered up in all this stuff and all these problems and the, and the drugs and the bad friends and the bad choices. So my mom finally says, enough is enough. Don't come back here anymore. I'm done. I could tell it was hard for her. I'm in a treatment center in the next 24 hours. I go to this treatment center. I'm there 30 days. For the first 30 days in seven, eight, nine years, I don't use drugs. Wow, I, I don't have to use drugs. Finally, that thing where I said I was quitting 10 times a day, I was quitting 10 times a day for the first time in my life, I was able to quit successfully. I'm leaving the treatment center when the insurance ran out, because that's how those work. When the money runs out, they boot you to the curb. I'm terrified, scared to go back to society. I don't have any friends that aren't using drugs. My girlfriend was using drugs. Everybody around me, everybody I knew used drugs. And I'm going back to a job where even at the job I had, they used drugs. And I'm like, I'm going back to an environment. I have to cut off all my friends. Not really friends. I got to cut off all the enemies, right? And, and I got to start over. And before I leave, the counselor grabs me and the counselor t says to me, look, dude, I'll see you back here. Probably, you know, if you don't die, I'll see you back here. And I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? I'm not coming back here. And he's like, oh, no, you're coming back. And then he gives me the lecture. He's like, you'll never make it. See, when you go to a treatment center, you tell them everything about your life. Like all your secrets, all your, 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 your inhibitions and, and your, you know, the things you want to do in your life, right? And so I'm telling them in this thing, everything I've done, everything I've done wrong, I share my whole life, but I also share with them what I want to do, my inspiration in life. I'm going to write books, I'm going to speak to audiences, I'm going to help people, I'm going to tell people the story about drugs and how damaging they are, and, and I'm going to be somebody, I, I tell them. And they're like, no, 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 you're a drug addict. And all you're ever going to be is what the counselor tells you. All you're ever going to be is a drug addict. You need to give up all the ideas of writing books, speaking to audiences, being rich. I always wanted to be rich. I wanted financially to be rich my whole life. I wanted to be my dad. I wanted to be the guy that could take care of his family. They said, you need to give up all those ideas and settle for one thing, not use the drugs. If the day ends and you don't use drugs, Grant, that is a good day for you. Anybody can dream it, but you'll never see it until you're willing to be committed to it. I was telling somebody the other day, when I didn't have anything, church didn't have any members, I'd get off work, working at Carbide, and drive up the roads and work on the church till I had to turn around and go back to work. We worked when we didn't have food. We worked when we didn't have lights. I was putting my whole check in the offering all of it trying to keep it going when I finally got some staff I went on the road preaching 
and whatever I made on the road preaching, I brought it home to make the payroll of the staff. And sometimes I got them paid and couldn't pay me. Commitments. Looked like a fool. Didn't have any clothes. Suits was falling off me. Lying and wore out my clothes. Couldn't send them to the cleaners. Had to wash my suit in the washing machine. They laughed at me. Looked like an old raggedy country preacher. I had holes in my shoes. I couldn't kneel down and pray because if I knelt down to pray, they would see holes in my shoes. They laughed at me. They said that boy's lost his mind. He'll never be nothing. He stutters. He's got a list for his speech. He'll never be a preacher. I don't care what you say. If you are committed to what you believe, He wants to rip you until you become impotent and so impoverished in your spirit that you are an empty building, a ghost town, a vacant house. Your lights are on, nobody's at home. You're going through the motions of life with the form of godliness, denying the power thereof. He doesn't mind how many days you live as long as you don't live in the days that you have. He wants to rob you and rape you and abuse you. In fact, the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He wants to sabotage your success because you were created to win. You were carved to win. You were set aside to win. You were formed to win. The part of meant for you to be a successful vessel of honor that you might be meat for the master's use. You were not meant to fail. You were not meant to die. You were not meant to quit. You were not meant to collapse. You were meant to live. Doctors still can't figure out why the human body dies because the body was meant to rebuild itself, refurbish itself, restrengthen itself. You were not meant to faint. You were not meant to collapse. You were not meant to have a nervous breakdown, a stress attack, a migraine headache, break out in nervous conditions and rashes and all types of diseases and hypertension and have stress attacks and heart attacks and nervous breakdowns. You were not meant to lose it, lose control, break out, kick the dog, slap the cat, kill the children, beat the wife, dog the children. You were not meant to be a failure. You were not meant to be destitute, to be lonely, to be hungry, to be isolated, to be driven. You were meant to be the head and not the tail, above only and not the deep. You were meant to prosper and live in goodly houses. You are children of the king, the heavenly host, the God of Israel dwells in the midst of you. Touch somebody tell them you don't even know who I am. Thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again. And I came to speak to somebody today who, who has some triumph in your life, but you've also got some trouble. You, you've got some joy in your life, but you've also got some sadness. Until you have had the taste of finishing, you will not respect yourself. Until you follow through, until something is done, come hell or high water, tears and struggles and pain, and you go through it anyway, and you show up and you continue to fight on, no matter the circumstances. Courage is the key. Courage is the key. Confidence, it is never the promise of God that is in question. It is our confidence in that promise. So why not reach down inside of you and come up with some more of those remarkable human gifts? They're there waiting to be discovered and employed. And I challenge you to do that because you can change. If you don't like how it is for you, change it. If it isn't enough, change it. If it doesn't suit you, change it. And I challenge you to do all that because you can change. See, you don't ever have to be the same after today, only by choice. Now for the process of change, just a philosophical pronouncement won't do. It takes more than that, and it takes more than enthusiasm. You can get all excited about lifting 200 pounds until you get to the gym. Then you need a new excitement, and the new excitement is discipline. Discipline, the major step to human progress. If there is one thing to get excited about, this is it. Get excited about your ability to make yourself do the necessary things to get a desired result. That's true excitement. 
So remember, if you find yourself doing something that doesn't seem to be supporting you in the long term, remember at some level your brain thinks it's supporting you, at least in the short term. Don't feel bad about it. Don't go, oh gosh, here I am, this failure. Some of the most successful people that I've interviewed and worked with have had self-sabotage. It's just a pattern we once in a while get, and you can just change it now. It's very easy. You can free yourself from self-sabotage right now by knowing from this day forward that if you ever start to sabotage yourself, one, try another approach. Maybe it's you're just not paying attention. Maybe you're not focusing. Maybe you just got some poor habits. For just bad habits, refocus and decide what you do want to accomplish. Really making personal changes calls for 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Wishing we could change is a beginning. But now wish must be translated into activity, and inspiration and affirmation must lead to discipline. We can affirm that we are going to change, but we must now form new habits and develop new disciplines for the affirmation to come true. We can look at developing ourselves spiritually, physically, and mentally. With respect to our spiritual development, this may be a major or a minor issue for you depending on your values and your goals. Come to your own decisions as to what it will take to nourish your spiritual nature. Next, let's look at physical development. The body and the mind work together and depend on each other, so they both need attention. Treat your body like a temple. So just put it in your notes, body like temple. Not a bad suggestion. Now, in taking care of the physical, we must learn to be conscious of ourselves, but not self-conscious. We need to be aware of our physical appearance, our physical well-being, but not to the point of being self-conscious. But some people devote too much of their day to physical appearance. Physical appearance is going to have something to do with your future, your well-being, so do spend some time on physical appearance. How we appear to other people does make a difference in terms of our acceptance and our ability to function and do well in the marketplace. If you do have a pattern, realize that any pattern you have, including self-sabotage, still comes back to one thing. Human beings, no matter what we're doing, including sabotaging ourselves, we do it for a positive intent. If it clearly is a pattern where you are subconsciously sabotaging yourself, screwing things up, hey, get excited. Don't get upset. Say, hey, look, my brain is doing what it does best. Personal development, how important. Remember, the major key to your better future is you. That's a sentence with a lot of value. The major key to your better future is you. For a share of my life, I didn't understand the importance of that phrase. I used to wonder why two people could work for the same company and one make twice as much money. Wouldn't that be a puzzle? I know there are many ways to do well, but in this narrow area called compensation, what is the difference? I thought time makes some of the difference. Some people do better because they have more time. Now, that's got to be dumb, right? You can't get someone else's time. There isn't any more time. Where would you find any? Hey, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, that's about it. It's over. There isn't any more time. If you insist on finding more than 24 hours a day, they will come and take you away. Identify a behavior that's keeping you from getting your goals, something that's stopping you or holding you back. Once you've identified it, ask yourself, what is the positive intent here? What is my brain trying to give me? Get some leverage on yourself so that you can make the change. Teach your brain that, hey, if I don't change this thing, you got to have a little conversation in your head. You see, what you become is far more important than what you get. However, it is also true that what you become directly influences what you get. Most of what we have, we have attracted by the person we have become. So here's the great challenge of life. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. That is the great focus of attention for life change. Now, on the other side of the coin, it reads, unless you change how you are, you'll always have what you've got. I've discovered that income does not usually exceed personal development. Sometimes income takes a lucky jump, but unless you keep growing out where it is, it will usually come back where you are. Life has strange ways. A very rich man once said, if you took all the money in the world and divided it equally among everybody, it would soon all be back in the same pockets. I guess it is hard to keep what you haven't attracted by your own personal development. It's not what we can do that's in question. What we can do is fantastic. 
What we can do is unbelievable. What we can do, it's what we settle for that's disappointing. What we become is what leads to all the good things. And the habits we form, habits of mind, attitude, and behavior, are a dominant part of what we are becoming. Now, I understand, as well as anyone, that forming new habits doesn't come easy. But new habits will come when we change. But rather by changing small pieces and parts at a time. I think that's how most of us change. We just keep nudging ourselves in the right direction, forming one or two new habits at a time, little by little, until finally we've made the turn. And this is where the good life comes from, those personal changes. There's nothing you can do with the seasons, but there's everything you can do with yourself. Wish for your own attitudes, strength, and capabilities to change in order to handle the winters time we will probably use them all unless somebody finally comes along and blows all those excuses apart to make us come face to face with the real reasons for our current dilemma until that time we will probably use another million excuses to prevent ourselves from having a million dollars here's one of the major questions i'll pose to you during this program what are you going to do starting today that will make a difference in how your life works out. See, if you don't do something starting today that will make a difference, guess what? It's going to be the same. And you can guess what the next five years are going to be like. Just look at the last five. Now here's another key question. What can you do starting today that will make a difference? That's a good question. What can you do? What can you do with economic chaos? What can you do with massive disappointment when it's all gone wrong? What can you do when it won't work, when you've run out of money, when you don't feel well, and it's all gone sour? What can you do? Well, let me give you the broad answer first. Here's what you can do. You can do the most remarkable things, no matter what happens. Hey, people can do incredible things, unbelievable things. A man can do the most amazing things with the most impossible circumstances. A woman can do the most remarkable things, with the most disastrous circumstances. Hey, I found out kids can do remarkable things. That is, if they have remarkable things to do. I also found out if they don't have remarkable things to do, there's no telling what they'll do. For things to change for you, you've got to change, no matter what successes you've already achieved. Otherwise, it isn't going to change for you. I sure hope things will change. That seemed to be my only hope. If it wasn't going to change, I was in serious trouble. Then I found out it wasn't going to change, and I was in serious trouble. Hey, remember, it isn't going to change. Not long ago, I did a seminar for a group of oil company executives during their convention in Honolulu. Sitting around this conference table, one of them asked, Mr. Rohn, you know some important people around the world. What do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? I said, gentlemen, I do know the right people. I can tell you. So they all listened very carefully. I said, gentlemen, based on the people I know and from the best of my own experience, I've concluded that in the coming 10 years, it's going to be about like it's always been. Need a little pick-me-up today? Welcome to the new Fresh Motivation app, where you'll find daily motivation, daily quotes, Listen to your favorite speeches in the background or with a black screen. So nothing interrupts your motivational moment where you can create your personal profile, create playlists of your favorite speeches and quotes, add personal notes, and start setting goals. Fresh Motivation, the home of motivation. Get it now for free on Google Play. There are two fundamental attitudes toward life and its sorrows. Those with the first attitude blame the world. Those with the second ask what they could do differently. It's much easier and much more gratifying to your basest desires to blame someone else for your misery. It's not about doing the occasional big things. It's about doing the consistent small things. If you go to the gym and you work out and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see nothing. And if you go to the gym the next day and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see nothing. So clearly there's no results, can't be measured, it must not be effective. So we quit. Or if you fundamentally believe that this is the right course of action, stick with it. 
you commit yourself to the regime, the exercise. If you stick with it consistently, I'm not exactly sure what day, but I know you'll start getting into shape. There's no event. It's an accumulation of lots and lots of little things that anyone by themselves is innocuous and useless. But if you do it consistently, and you do it in combination with lots of other little things, it's those little innocuous things that you do over and over and over and over that matter the most. When you're consistently good, when you are consistently true to your word and to your values, when what you say and what you do consistently measures up, and that there's a sense of cohesion in your thoughts and your words and your actions and your questions, when all of it comes together in a consistent way, then all of a sudden the people say, I buy into that person. What I did yesterday got me to where I am today. But what I did yesterday is not going to help me to stay where I am today. Do you understand me? You don't get out of life what you want. You get what you earn. Here, this is an everyday gig. Every day is a Monday. Every day is a beginning, a new day, a new shot at life. An opportunity to come out of the gate like a man possessed and attack the day without mercy. Every one of you in five years from now is going to arrive somewhere. Here's the thing. So many people, we just throw our lives up in the air and rely on chance and just hope it all works out. You don't have to throw your life up to chance. Your life can be a choice and you can choose where you want to go the next five years and beyond. You are powerful and you are impactful and you are in control. Today, I'm putting the pressure on. I'm the aggressor. I'm on the attack. And I will not stop. They said I couldn't. They said I wouldn't. They said they didn't believe in me. They said I couldn't because of my circumstances. I couldn't because of my past. Because it hadn't been done before. I said, so what? You can complain and remain the same, or you can decide, commit, and work towards becoming someone that no one thought you could be. You have to deal with the reality of the situation. Dwelling and pondering and crying doesn't do sh and it especially doesn't do sh in this eco chamber. In this arena, there is no crying. You can cry. You're just gonna lose. And I have bad news about complaining and crying. Nobody gives a sh I may not like it, but I'm not a whiner. I'm a warrior. I know I can handle this. You have that attitude, you'll come out stronger, increased, promoted, better than you were before. We've all heard the saying, no pain, no gain. If everything was always easy, we wouldn't be prepared for our destiny. You don't like where you are? Change something. You don't like your body? Change something. You don't like your job? Change it. Do something about it. Complaining about your situation is not going to change your situation. No one is coming to save you. Negative is normal. It's not successful, but it's normal. It's part of life. You must learn to handle the negative. Don't ignore it. Handle it. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to dwell on it. But you do have to handle it. My opinion. And I'm saying to you, what if all of us took that attitude after we face a rejection and a no, or we have a meeting and no one shows up, or somebody say, you can count on me, and they don't come through. What if we have that kind of attitude? The cause repossessed. Nobody believes in you. You've lost again and again and again. The lights are cut off. But you're still looking at your dream, reviewing it every day and say to yourself, it's not over until I win. The poor pessimist leads an ugly life. Pessimism, the deadly disease of always looking on the bad side, the problem side, the difficult side, checking all the reasons why it can't be done. He doesn't try to figure out what's right. He tries to figure out what's wrong. He doesn't look for virtue, he looks for faults. And when he finds them, he's delighted. How ugly. This is the poor guy looks through the window, doesn't see the sunset. He sees the specks on the window. 
And this is the poor guy, right, who rushes up, takes such leave of his senses. This guy rushes up and he says, I've got five good reasons why it won't work. He's so dumb, he doesn't know. All he needs one. He's got five. To the pessimist, the glass is always half empty. To the optimist, the glass is half full. Why would the same measure affect people two different ways? Answer, it all depends on how you look at it. Our lives are mostly affected by the way we think things are, not the way they are. The way we think they are affects us most. There's a subject we don't have time to get into tonight called better thinking habits. One of the major things Shof taught me when I met him, he said, poor thinking habits keeps most people poor. Not poor working habits. Most people work hard, but they don't think hard. And Shof taught me that the mind is like a factory, a mental factory. And whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. And that's what builds the economic, social, financial fabric of your life. He quoted me a Bible phrase that says, as you think, so you become. How awesome. When he talked about poor thinking habits, he had me. I used to start the day reading the morning newspaper. I mean, you can believe that or not. I'd get a cup of coffee and read the paper. I'd load up on wars and riots and murders and stabbings and killings and bank robberies and muggings and car wrecks and tragedies. I'd even read the back pages. I seemed to like that stuff for some weird reason. I'd load up on all that and then I'd start the day. You can imagine the kind of days I used to have. You walk around on your financial knees. They call you economic peewee. The guy says, I want to be a great leader. Wonderful. The first thing we do is follow him to his house. When we get there, we walk in and check his library. Number one. Somebody says, well, why check his library? The reason is because what a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. You would not believe what some people have got in their house to read. You would not believe. One of the best dressed up words I know for a lot of it is trash. Can you imagine dumping a barrel of trash into this mental factory every day and coming out with a rich, dynamic, positive life? It can't be done. <laughs> Life ain't love, man. Life is, this is what life is. Life is hard work, life is faith, and life is grace. If you, if you, if you can get, if you understand that you gotta work hard, faith without works is dead. You just keep the faith and work really hard and then ask God for as much grace as he can give you. Grace is God's unmerited faith. He gives you stuff you don't deserve. That's what you want out of life. You want God to do something for you that you, you just don't deserve it. That's what it is. Somebody was playing golf with a guy that owns Mayo Clinic one time. He told me, he said, justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. And you hear old people say, all I want is a little more grace. I just want some grace. I want God to give me a house that I don't really deserve. I want him to give me a lifestyle I don't really deserve. See, that's a problem with people. They think they deserve something. No, you don't. I work really hard. Everybody work hard. You just need some grace, man. You need God to just give you something that ain't on your vision. You just need God to give you something that you didn't even ask for. That's when life gets real special. All I want is a little more grace. Like I got a vision board, right? But I ask God that his will be done in my life. Because what I can want, it can never compare to what God can give. You see what I'm saying? So you can want all you want. But if you line up with the will of God, what God has planned for you is way better than anything you could ever plan. You can't outthink him. That's how you get the life of your dreams, man. You set your goals and your aspirations, but then you leave the open end to your, thy will be done on earth as it is. In, it's the Lord's prayer. Man, it, it's not, a, you know, when your mama teaches to you as a little kid, it's like really the dopest prayer, man. Give us this day our daily bread. Don't ask for nothing else. Quit worrying about tomorrow. Just if 
help me make decisions for today that let me live the best day. When you worry about tomorrow, you off into something you have no say so in. You have no control. So why would you worry? By worrying does not add a single hour to a day. Not one hour. So what you got to ask God for is your daily bread. Just for today. You'd be amazed what would happen to you if you could trip about tomorrow. Just today. Today is plenty. Today is so added. That's why he gives us 24 hours. And he breaks it up into day and night. You know why? Because he knows 24 is too much. So he lets you stay up during the daytime, let you go to bed at night so you can recover. You do think I'm lying. Stay up 24 hours to see what happens. Just stay up 24 hours to see what happens. You ain't gonna be, it's too much. That's that's a real, you know, people are, they write books about success. And people kill me when they write about success, but they don't tell people about God. If you're trying to be successful without God, you ain't going to make it. You can try, but you're not going to make it. You might make it a little way, but you can't stay there. It's not sustaining. You have to have faith, man. And I was talking the other day and a lady, in, not, not this year, but a lady in the crowd said, I don't believe in God. Okay, well, I didn't know you was coming, so I'm just talking to the other people in here who get it. You know, if you're an atheist, I don't care. That don't bother me. So I told me, well, as a Christian, it's your job to convert. I'm not in the conversion business. I ain't that good critic. You don't believe in God? Go to hell. I got a problem with that. You want to go to hell? That's you. Go. Knock yourself out. There's plenty of room. But I got news for you. Hell going to be packed. That lady just shaking her head. I can't believe he's saying this. Yeah, it's humor. That's how I work. I just, I work off that. You know, I'm, I'm not that Christian. I'm not in the conversion business. I'm not in the save soul business. I tell jokes. If you want to go to hell, I'm perfectly comfortable with you. Just don't drag me with you. You want to go to hell? I was interviewing this guy. He said, well, Steve, you're a Christian. Suppose there's no heaven. Well, then I live the best life I could and there's no heaven. You got a bigger problem pose it is and you don't go I don't believe God will burn this up no. I don't know about all that I take a chance heaven, streets of gold springs fine you know the real reason I want to go to heaven because I want to see my mom that's all with cement the kids back in Danbury, Connecticut, high school, they're asking me questions one day. I'm talking to the kids. Kids got good questions these days. One of them said to me, Mr. Rohn, how do you build the good life? I said, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Here's how you build anything. Select the right ingredients, keep out the wrong ingredients, and it starts with thought. Everything starts with thought. So you must be wise and careful what you think about, because that starts everything. You got to be wise and careful. I asked the kids, what would happen if somebody dropped sugar in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be okay. I said, what if somebody dropped strychnine in my coffee? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson one, life is both sugar and strychnine. You gotta be careful. I said, what if my worst enemy drops in the sugar? They said, will you be okay? I said, what if my best friend, even by accident, drops in the strychnine? They said, well, you'd be dead. I said, correct. Lesson two, watch your coat. You gotta be careful. See, it doesn't matter who hands you the bad stuff. It doesn't matter where you get the bad stuff. It'll still do its damage on your bank account. Wherever you get it, Mr. Schoff gave me one of the greatest phrases when I first met him when he said, Jim, every day stand guard at the door of your mind. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal 
without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient. So I was trying to work that out in the chapter. And this is something I've had to work out a lot as a clinical psychologist. It's like, well, let's say you need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, a bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, it's, it's because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is, and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal prox difficult but proximal. One of the things I've thought about a fair bit is the meaning of the Sermon on the Mount. And as far as I can tell, it's, it's, a, it's basically a two-part two wisdom. The first is that you should aim at the highest good that you can imagine. And that would be a good that includes everyone, right? So if I wanted what was good for you, say, if I genuinely wanted it, I want it in a way that was good for you now and good in the long run, good for you and your family and your community, and maybe good for me too. You know, you could conceive of that as the desire. And I think that's a good definition of love, is that you actually want the best, you want the best possible outcome. And in the Gospels, of course, that's extended even to your enemies. Yes. Right? Is that, okay, if we're going to have things good, let's have it good enough for even the people that set themselves up against me. Because if the world was running properly, things would be good for them too. And that would be better. And it seems to me that that's a very good way of looking at things. It's a difficult way of looking at things. And then the second part of the Sermon on the Mount is something like, having established that as your aim, which is no easy thing, by the way, right? Because you have to be pretty clear-headed and single-minded to actually want that to be your aim. Then you can concentrate on the day and you can try telling the truth. And you can ally, so there's truth and love that are allied together. Truth, love, and attention, it's something like that that are all allied together. Um, with regards to transgressing against the vulnerable, 